Well, thank you both very much for agreeing to this, and um, particularly for agreeing to something which you actually don't know that much about. You know, it's a, <laughs> a kind of conversation that will be hopefully just very open, very relaxed, uh, you know, um, just to kind of invite us all really to kind of uh, consider the, the, the nature of uh, this book, uh, the themes of the conference, get us in the mood for what we imagine will be the more technical discussions um, tomorrow and Saturday. So that's really what we're planning with these two round tables. Um, I do want to create as relaxed and kind of informal a, a feel as we can. Uh, so I will kick off by asking Cecile and Simon uh, some, some questions, but feel free if there's something that immediately kind of sparks your interest or you want to chip in, catch my attention, you know, and we'll, we'll weave in the conversation as we go. If I'm looking in the wrong direction, you know, just throw something quite hard at my head and, uh, you know, that'll do the job too. Um, so, yeah, like I say, we'll kick off with some questions, then a just discussion amongst us all. Um, we've got about, I mean, if we want to keep it to roughly time, about an hour 15, hour 20, but we've got some bagginess as well, depending on how things go, so we can, we can see how, how it works out. Uh, I just want to do some very quick uh, introductions. Uh, Simon Mills, um, uh, I hope this is still correct, senior lecturer in new media. Associate professor now. Associate now. professor. <laughs> it's the big news. Woo hey, hey, cool. <laughs> Associate professor. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what that means. Actually. That's an interesting term, isn't it, that one? Yeah. 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 It means more admin. That's what is it that means. what it means? <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Uh, these, uh, these terms tend to mean more admin. Uh, Associate professor in new media, Leicester Media School, De Montfort University. And uh, crucially, of course, author of uh, Good Wars Simondon, Information, Technology and Media, as well as, of course, many articles on Simondon's work. And also uh, Cecile Maspina, uh, Associate Researcher. Is that the technical yes, term? I, I don't think there's a technical term. Yeah. I'm associated, affiliated. Yeah. Hmm? And uh, recently affiliated with the University of Nantes. Yeah. See, you get all the news here first. <laughs> yeah, it's very new. I yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and as well as that position, um, uh, at the CNRS uh, Lab Sphere. Yes. Which I think so sounds really fascinating. That is uh, an affiliation with that um, yeah. research group, yes. Yeah, fantastic. At Paddy which, is where, which is where I did my PhD. Yeah, lovely. Thanks. Um, Cecile is also uh, author of um, An Epistemology of Noise. And, uh, of course, <clears throat> as we've already said, uh, the um, co-translator of the book that was the spur to the conference. And if it's okay, Cecile, I think for that reason I'd like to just start with you. Um, and if perhaps you could just tell us a little bit about how you came to be involved in the translation of the work and what kind of challenges the translation kind of threw up for you and perhaps also for John Rockwell as well. Um, the way I got involved with this translation is initially I wanted to translate uh, Imagination et Invention uh, together with a researcher in France called Anne Lefebvre with whom I've worked a lot in the past and still presently and uh, we got the proposal through and accepted by Continuum and then uh, uh, Simon Dan's daughter Nathalie she wasn't sure where she wanted to bring the corpus of translations of, uh, of Simon Dan. So that kind of it got quiet on that front for a while. And a few years later, actually, was through a conversation. And I'd already given up completely on the idea of, of doing the translation. And we met after a conference and had a chat. And, um, and the project kind of got reborn from there. And, and then it was the mode of existence of technical objects. Yeah. So the biggest problem I encountered was the technical terms. And not just the technical terms, is, is to actually get to grips with what all these things are and why they matter. And some of them are almost archaeological now because they were meaningful at a time when computers were being first developed. And uh, so I kind of had to, had to delve into that quite a bit. And um, Did you yeah. have to become quite a specialist on engines and capacitors and I things like that. I immediately forgot <laughs> almost everything <laughs> yeah, I learned, but I made sure that I understood yeah. and could could actually visually have a visual appreciation of yeah. the schemas of operation that were yeah. involved. So I, I didn't skip over anything. And uh, also Simon Don's son, 
uh, Dominique is an engineer and he was extremely helpful because I was I equipped myself with the only available dictionary of translation of engineering terms from the, the one that I found from French to English because I suppose most engineers just have the English vocabulary already uh, so that might be quite an old one and, and slightly dated and Dominique was very good at, uh, at reworking all the technical terms and I also want to mention that there was a translation a partial translation already um, available on, on the internet uh, for many years mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm sorry that it wasn't brought to fruition and, and I, but I always want to mention this and, and say that it's uh, I, I couldn't really use it very much because it was harder to read Simondon through this mm -hmm. lens of someone's choice rather than try and translate it myself. So I tried at the beginning to, to see but that just made my own mind and the existing translation and and the book that was too much. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's uh, but the name has just slipped my mind. Yes, Nadita the Melanthes. Mel the Melanthes, Mel yes. Mel um, just, I mean, one of the one of the interesting words um, that you have to grapple with, kind of from the title onwards, is technical and or technique or techniques. I mean, did you feel comfortable in the kind of French-English um, translation of, of, of those words? Because it plays obviously such an important role in, in, in the book. Yes, I think that because there exists already a, a corpus of, of texts in English yeah. uh, where the word technics had kind of established itself, um, it becomes jargon to a certain extent, but it's necessary because a technology in French has the emphasis on, on the idea of logic, so the science of techniques rather than the techniques themselves. So I think um, that was a, a good compromise. Yeah. Interesting. Thanks, Cecile. Um, Simon, I wonder if I could just um, bring you in for a bit here. Um, you know, you, you've, you've written about kind of Simon Dahl's work uh, as a whole, mm. and um, I wonder how you see this particular work fitting uh, into his oeuvre kind of more broadly. The, the role that this work plays, just, I mean, in general terms? Um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting that in England, the reception of Simon Dunn has mainly been through, I think, the work on techniques, technical objects. Oh, oh sorry, Simon, do you mind? Oh, sorry. Years. No, sorry. Um, so, so when I first um, got to know about Simon Dunn, it was, it was through the work on technical objects, and that was generally how people in the UK discuss Simon Don. Um, but when one investigates his uh, his original thesis, um, you start to understand that he's actually a, more of a philosopher of nature, really, right. and you know, with the philosophy of individuation. That's how I see him, anyway. Mm -hmm. And the, in, in 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 a sense. This book is kind of a complement to the philosophy of nature that he develops. Yeah. Um, and then I think the other important book, the book that Cecile mentioned, Imagination and Invention, um, develops that even further into a kind yeah. of a more way. And, and so that's quite an interesting thing for you as a kind of uh, as a theorist of new media to be dealing with someone who, in a sense, is, a, is kind of presented to us in English as a you know, a, th a thinker of technical objects, yeah. but who has this philosophy of nature behind it? I mean, did that? Did you find that a challenge as you kind of approach the the, the oeuvre of the whole? Yeah, I mean, the way, I mean, how I how I came to to, to work on Simon Don anyway was was through doing my PhD. Yeah. Uh, my supervisor Ian Hamilton Grant uh, was obviously involved in speculative realism at the time. Um, obviously, very interested in realism, idealism. And although I wanted my, my PhD to involve thinking about technology, I was coming from a philosophy background, I was interested in those mm -hmm. broader questions of ontology yeah. anyway. So Simon Dunn kind of um, interested me on a number of levels, really. It enabled yeah. me to do a number of things. Yeah. First of all, think about more broadly about questions of causality that I was interested mm -hmm. in, and especially in relation to, to cybernetics, which yeah. is obviously very important for yeah. uh, the the you know, the digital age. Um, so, so it became very attractive as a, as almost a systemic thinker. Mm. 
yeah. who wasn't just, you know, if you think you're thinking about a lot of the work that I come across in, in media and communication as a discipline, yeah. you know, it does tend to stem, from, especially in, in this country, from uh, British cultural studies. Yeah. It's very much underpinned by the Raymond Williams, yeah. um, and obviously over time introduced other kind of Foucault with him as yeah. important. Uh, and I thought Simondon offered something. Well, he's kind of interesting because he was almost modernist, right? Mm -hmm. modern. And that kind of interested me, actually. Yeah. To think, yeah. You could always cut away this whole postmodern kind yeah. of aspect of, yeah. uh, of thinking in media communication and, and try and go back to something yeah. a little bit before that. And that kind of really excited me. You know, I've got, I've got a feeling that actually that's going to be one of the kind of key themes over the next couple of days is kind of thinking about how. Uh, Simondon's work, which has this, what should we call it, you know, pre-postmodern mm. feel to it, has nonetheless been kind of picked up yeah. in this post-postmodern situation, and how we think about that relationship then. Uh, I suspect it's going to be a big thing for us. I might even uh, come on to it um, uh, a little bit further in our conversation. Um, just um, in terms of our opening remarks, um, anything anybody wants to, to, to chip in? Are we, are we okay at the moment? Well, I'd like to just, I'd like to actually kind of bring uh, this book into uh, its context. So I think that might be interesting. Mm -hmm. So if I can ask you both about the, the way that you understand the, the, the context of this work. So published first in French in 58, that in itself indicates a certain, a certain kind of immediate kind of context, post-war context. Um, Two, of, two elements of which, but by all means introduce others if, if, you, if you want to, two elements of which seem to me to be obviously the emergent um, discussion of cybernetics, um, but also just, if I can put it this way, you know, the context of post-war French philosophy and the kind of legacy of uh, anyone from Canguilhem, but also how this kind of arrived in a scene that was still as I understand it, relatively kind of dominated by the kind of existentialist kind of moment. So I don't know if you, if, if, how you kind of understand the context of this book, and maybe maybe you understand it in different sorts of ways. But maybe Cecile first. I mean, how do you see it, its arrival into the world, if you like, and what, you know, what that kind of context was like? It's a really difficult question, I think, because it's also a contested legacy to a certain extent. Um, my impression is that. By having um, Merleau-Ponty on the one hand and Conguilherme on the other hand uh, as philosophers he respected and who have to a certain extent contributed to shaping his thinking, I have the impression that you could almost put it in the terms of his own philosophy, that his philosophy is a way of resolution between something that at the time was uh, incompatible. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, uh, philosophy of the subject that takes the individual seriously. And mm. I mean, seriously, it's not that Conghilhem doesn't take the individual seriously. It's just that you have what they call the philosophy of the concept on the one hand the friend with French epistemology, and on the other hand, existentialism and phenomenology. Perhaps the difference is even overstated. I'm not entirely sure. But I have the impression that to a certain extent, his the uniqueness of his work in that context um, which isn't only the fact that other philosophers were often ill-equipped to understand the technicality of his work. Um, I think the uniqueness is this resolution of this conflict, to think about individuality, but within a philosophy that um, that is, yeah, it's a philosophy of nature, but he also talks about the individuation of thought as something that has its own intrinsic necessity. And then sometimes he mentions an axiomatic, and it's difficult to say anything de definitive about it unless you're you know, you make it your thesis, I guess, mm. yeah. to make the proper point about this. But I, that's my impression yeah. that there's a kind of. And do you, I mean, do you see that um, explicitly in uh, Dumode, or are you really thinking about his kind of his project as a whole here? I mean, do you think uh, this text itself has that kind of bringing together of of the kind of concept and existence, if you like? Um, now that you ask me, I think. In the concept of trans-individuation, mm. there's a moment that I'm curious about, which is this idea of pure information. Mm. And what gets trans-individuated, what is that? What is the, the status of that intellect that mm. is shared? And what is the intrinsic necessity of those thoughts? Mm. 
I think if I mean I, I like French epistemology a lot, so I, I, it makes me think that there is something in the rigor of this trans individual thinking that is analogous to the intrinsic necessity of technicity um, that I, I think to a certain extent also answers this uh, divide between the philosophy of the concept and on the other hand something that is absolutely embodied and yeah. you know, meaningful to individuals and, and yeah. collectors. He does identify technicity with the trans individual on a couple of occasions, doesn't he? Which I don't think that's relevant to that. Which, which part is it? I'm to, I can't go. I just know. I remember. It's part of the somewhere. <laughs> 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 I know. I know. I can remember that there is somewhere where he talks. Well, in in my mind, I, I would say this is it's this rigor of an axiomatic of something that has to follow its own intrinsic necessity rather than tastes or um, wants or needs or market yeah. requirements. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Simon, I mean, how do you how do you see the context here? I mean, um, I don't know if I don't know if it's, it's an invitation more to the kind of cybernetic end of it. Yeah, or? I mean, that, I mean, Cecile's obviously uh, spot on with, with her assessment in regard to to French epistemology. Um, but I guess my, my interest came from more more of these contexts within thinking about cybernetics at the yeah. time, yeah. and how he. Um, how he wanted to reform cybernetics and the nature of, of that reformation, really. Yeah. Um, trying to think. I wonder if it might, if, forgive me, Sam, but I wonder if it might be useful just to kind of have a little bit of your sense of, of the kind of emergence of the notion of cybernetics and, and, and its, you know, broadly, broad brush stroke kind of debates and, and, and you know, the importance of media, for example, as yeah, well. Yes. About that for a while. But um, I mean, the emergence of cybernetics was, was really around the sciences of, of control and communication um, coming out of the, the war time and the post war period, on, on the whole, as, as I can understand it, and was a, a interdisciplinary endeavour which really um, came together around figures like Claude Shannon and Robert Mann and the notion of information that they were trying to, to come up with and disagreed regarding. Uh, about regarding what what that implied and how far that could be taken, whether it could go beyond uh, a technical notion of information, such as the, the Shannon Weaver model, or whether it, and you know, uh, or Norbert Weiner's taking it more into understanding biological processes within this kind of um, the use of uh, concepts such as information. So I think that's what the heart of the project is, and I think Simondon has. Uh, the same interdisciplinary uh, endeavour. He's very excited about this, but at the same time, he's concerned about what this notion of information mm -hmm. is doing, what it implies, and how it, it needs to be reformed. So that's kind of how I kind of yeah. understand him within that context. I have a feeling that we're going to, you know, get quite a lot of our um, kind of technical detail around the notion mm -hmm. of information, of course, as the papers. Uh, if you get the papers over the next couple of days, because it is so central, isn't it? And yeah, I mean, what, what I guess what I try to do in, in, in my book, and, and it's you know contestable, I'm sure, is connect Simondon's thought up with the emergence of, of theories around complexity, really, mm. which I guess were um, not, as far as I know, weren't really prevalent at the time in, in any way or form. It came later, in, 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 in a sense, that I, I see Simondon as maybe a precursor to complexity theory, but I feel that that's kind of what he was moving towards, um, especially with the, the notion of, of, of the phase shift and the kind of thermodynamic notions, which obviously is where a lot of complexity theory was, came from. So so I'm kind of interested in, in making that connection. Um, so that's kind of what I, what I try to do in my book, as well as tying that up also with, with some Analytical theories on causality, which I'm hoping to try and make it coherent in some way. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> there's a sense in which um, I think you're both suggesting, in a certain sort of way, that there is mm, there's obviously a timeliness to the book because it's you know it's a book that emerges in its context and it's it's got its um, it's got its precursors, it's got its debates, it's situated one can think about it in those sorts of ways. But but there's also a kind of hint almost that it's it's got a certain kind of untimely quality to it yeah. that 
it, it's not explained um, by its context. Now, I guess one could say that about any interesting, creative, systematic work. Um, but it certainly seems to be true about this book as well, that there's a kind of untimely element that seems to go back and forth across our kind of standard um, theoretical, philosophical chronologies, because it doesn't seem to sit happily in, in, in any particular spot. Uh, you want to drag it forward, or you want to drag it to the side, or you want to, it cuts across different disciplines as well. I mean, would that be fair, that there's a kind of untimely quality to the book? Yes, I, I feel like that very much. And that's why I was slightly embarrassed when you asked me the question, because I, uh, on the one hand, you know, the, it's wrong to overplay the, the proximity to French epistemology, for instance, or to phenomenology. And, and you, it's wrong also to say that he's abstracted himself from his philosophical milieu. It's just that um, I think his method of thinking about what is available for thought as incompatibilities and very resolutely seeking the kind of point of highest tension, if you like, yeah. for a way of resolution that is his quite extraordinary philosophy of nature. And in this I agree completely that it's, it's not just a philosophy of techniques. It's, yeah. it's, it's, I don't know, it's difficult for me to, to really categorize him in that mm -hmm. way in a, in a historical. Even now, I would say that he's extremely contemporary. And at the same time, he's off as well yeah. in a way that makes it that makes our contemporaneity strange to ourselves when we look at it through his lens. I think that's really beautifully put. Actually, that's very much the experience I have when I read it. It's it, there are times when I feel like I'm just being kind of lost in a in a world of 1950s technology that you know I don't understand current technology. I certainly don't understand 1950s technology, uh, but. Um, but kind of being lost in that kind of world, and at the same time feeling like he's onto something futural mm -hmm. that I'm not quite grasping. But there's something he seems to have um, got his hands on that is very much about what's happening now, and what's becoming now in terms of our technological domain. I mean, yeah, I, I agree to, completely. I, 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 I do. Much as I love Simondon, it, it, it sometimes feels like you're banging your head against the wall to try and draw out what that is that makes him relevant to the contemporary situation. Um, and sometimes it seems obvious, and then sometimes you just think, <laughs> yeah. am, I, am I going in completely the wrong direction? And um, I think part of that is to do with the change in techniques that we've undergone. Yeah. And, you know, what, what is, is so exciting in Simondon, especially in the, the la latter stages of on the mode of existence, is his, for me anyway, his, what excites me is, is his, the way he relates technical change to changes in systems of thought. Yeah. But of course, if we've got another technical changes, well, what is the accompanying change in systems of thought? Can we draw from Simondon the necessary resources to think about our contemporary situation, or actually, uh, are we are we being fools trying to, <laughs> to yeah. do that? And, yeah. and that's yeah. kind of what what I find exciting and frustrating. Yeah. And, yeah. And, it's kind of and again, it's, it strikes me that just kind of you know looking through the abstracts we've got for the next couple of days, I think we're going to get mm -hmm. um, a fair amount of kind of discussion about exactly that. Yeah, yeah. You know, what what's the What's the value of bringing someone on forward, if you like, to today? Even though it feels completely relevant and pertinent, there's still questions to be asked, I think, about just exactly how yeah. to make him work uh, today. Um, I think this might be a good, uh, a good time to just um, draw out two big themes um, that seem to be present in, in uh, Simonon's work, uh, and in Dumont, uh, particularly, um, that on the one hand might seem slightly anachronistic today, and yet on the other hand, it might be precisely the time when we do need to reconsider these terms. And the two terms that I have in mind in particular are the human and progress. And that actually there's something uh, challenging for me as a reader of Simondon, who, and, and you know, I, 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 you know, I grew up in the kind of, you know, intellectually grew up in the white heat of this thing called postmodernism, 
and kind of swallowed, um, you know, far too many. I didn't. I was going to say swallowed far too many pills. That makes, it, that, that makes it sound like I was having a very good time. No, I'd read too many books that, um, uh, you know, just bashed humanism and bashed, bashed progress. And it, they, these were these were things we just had to get beyond. Um, so it's quite difficult for me, kind of approaching the, the work again and kind of seeing the human being kind of rethought in interesting ways by Simondon. Uh, and gra grappling, my grappling, but also Simondon's grappling with the legacy of humanism, but also how he wants to rework it, and then whether that reworking now in a post postmodern or post post structuralist moment is really the one that we want to kind of latch on to. Um, so, in the first instance, I think I'd just like to kind of invite you both to uh, kind of think about the human and progress in Simondon and how, how you both understand it. Maybe Cecile first. Yeah, well, it's really fast. Oh, sorry. I mean, <laughs> no, I'm it joking, doesn't, joking. Have, doesn't have to No, no, be, no, I'm, I'm fine with it. <laughs> it's good. It's, it's absolutely fine. I was, uh, just last night, I was rereading his little text on, I think it's called The Nature of Human Progress, or mm -hmm. in the back of the, um, it's republished in yeah. the back of a little book at the, after a conference about Simon Dau in the 1990s. And um, it's a really odd little text. Mm. And I think uh, this, slight unease that you were talking about. I mean, is it this kind of modernism that still goes on there, but you can never really quite catch Simon Don because he's, he then opens it up yeah. again. So you have this idea of a succession of, of phases. You have, he talks about the Greeks and thought and democracy, and he says that's only suited to a relatively small um, extension, literally a geographical extension. Um, and then you have religion, which is much better suited to uh, saturate itself along the geographical lines of something like an empire, mm -hmm. and um, and then you have techniques, and God knows where that's how that curve of saturation, if it will follow a similar curve, where towards the end it, it kind of reaches a technocracy and sterility to a certain extent, or whether there's still potential for this to to develop further. And uh, so what I liked about that was the idea that you have that you open up almost through a kind of unaware collective invention, although you might say you have a prophet like a prophet or a, a messiah or whatever in the case of religion. But there, there is a, a, a domain of individuation that opens up and then the idea that it could saturate and then there's infinite such domains. The question of their succession or their suitability for a given moment in time for me is whether they are necessarily a development like the, develop, the developmental stages of a child to an adult. Do we have to go through thought and then religion and then technicity? Or is it just the fact that you know things happen and then you develop them until they saturate and then eventually you move on to something else? Um, so at the same time, for different reasons, I was looking at a small text by, um, uh, by Strauss, Levi Strauss, uh, on Montaigne the idea of um, anthropology and revolution. So there are two different conferences that were published in the same little book, in which he really quite derides the idea that human evolution goes through stages. So if there is an element of that in Simon Dor, and I think he's actually, in the small print, he's cautious enough not to put it quite like that, mm -hmm. but it can sound like that a little bit. Sure. Um, that would be the, the aspect I would find less interesting to pursue. On the other hand, this idea that you could have from a kind of new thought, an area of extension and individuation of something like a particular form of thought or religion or techniques, that, that I think is, is a, could, could be the basis for a method of, of looking at what's happening, um, but uh, uh, it's with caution, I would say. Yeah, well, well yes, I think that, that caution's important, isn't it? But <clears throat> in a sense, that kind of, um, extension that you're talking about at that level if we take it away from the the, the kind of almost kind of supra historical kind of narratives but it, but within a, a moment a technical moment we would have that extension that move towards saturation there could still be it seems to me reading something on a sense in which he wants to talk about progress within that moment i mean is that is that is that fair, do you think? Or, or yeah, uh, what, what, what did he say? He said, uh, it's only progress if it expands the possibilities for thought and action. 
So I think in that e to that extent, if you have new areas of individuation, if they if they contribute to enlarging the possibility of what can be thought and done, then it's that in itself is a form of progress. But it, it, he doesn't think of it in in terms of a kind of constant improvement mm -hmm. of mankind along a linear line. And I, that's how I, yeah. in the end, I, I chose to interpret that text. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Simon. Yeah, I'm not, uh, Cecile's spot on as, as usual. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a number of, I mean, sim there's a number of ways you could approach this question. I think mm. it's, yeah. it's, it's again difficult to pick down. Yeah. I mean, with the notion of, of progress, I mean, he he explicitly talks about that kind of Western idea of progress as improvement in the standard of living. He's very disparaging yeah. of that idea as uh, one of the ideas of the great universal ideologies of the 20th century and um, he, he, he obviously disagrees with it because it doesn't um, take into account the techniques mm -hmm. the, it, it's, it's the idea of progress can be can be used uh, because of you know the extraneous things that are added to techniques which actually undermine the technicity as well kind of key terms or, or some of the key terms that, that maybe Simenden or I think of Simenden are using which kind of relates to the idea of, of both progress and, and humanism is is openness mm -hmm. is, um, and the openness that comes in the tension between <coughs> regulation and invention I, I, I see a lot I think of, of the movement that comes in Simenden is between the regulation of the kind of universal thoughts he thinks about, so things like religious tradition or traditions that grow out of industrial techniques, with the more the openness of invention that makes use of the kind of potentialities that, that are inherent or the potentialities that come about from the, usually the, the kind of singularity of the technical that's mm -hmm. thrown into that, mm -hmm. what might be a metastable phase. <laughs> to use his terminology, which already yeah. kind of muddies the water. So, so, so progress, yeah, is is it's. it's yeah. Speak a little bit louder, because it's very difficult. I'm to so speak sorry. I mean, sorry. Um, and my apologies for the room. It's yeah, you know we're, the we're idea is because we are talking to each other. Yeah, yes, so you, 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 please take us in consideration. I'm sorry. Because it's very interesting, and I cannot, I cannot. Yeah. Yeah, understand everything. Sorry. Thanks, Al. Um. So progress in that sense, uh, I mean, going back to, because I was talking about this in, in my talk, uh, the, the, the schema he gives towards the end of the development of thought along with techniques. So technical thought does offer a kind of progress, but it, I think it's not progress in the sense of the way it's normally understood. Mm -hmm. But it's progress in the sense of enabling invention, enabling uh, developments in, in, in thought and in in new techniques and understanding new schemas of techniques which can be analogically applied elsewhere. So I think it's more that, which I think is kind of what you were saying in, in, in a different way. Um, so so that's kind of the sense of the progress and humanism. He 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 relates. In one place, human, he said of humanism as, as the overcoming of, of alienation, mm -hmm. because with these developments, new alienations occur, and he he, he connects in one one place anyway the, 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 the humanism to you know, new humanisms in overcoming alienations, yeah. Yeah. Um, which for him involves this this kind of new encyclopedic project that he has. Um, so it's ex kind of exciting because he, he doesn't define the human, he yeah. kind of leaves it as a, a very open subject, which I think rings, uh, which, which, is, which is coherent with a lot of the discussions we see around post-humanism in the contemporary. I don't yeah. know if that makes sense or not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, thanks. Um, I mean, one of, the, one of the other elements I think I'd like to, um, to just bring in, and I think it, I think it follows, I hope, anyway, kind of fairly uh, naturally from particularly that kind of thought about alienation, <clears throat> is um, a very kind of striking analogy that he uses, um, particularly at the beginning of the book, um, but then it kind of pops up 
um, several moments throughout where uh, the kind of contemporary status of the technical object is linked to uh, the status of slavery. And there's, you know, some, it seems to me quite striking that this connection is made. Um, maybe, it's, maybe it's because, you know, um, in a sense, you know, one needs to kind of absorb uh, Simondon's own position on the technical object in order to come to that statement. But certainly kind of reading it um, fresh, it's a jarring statement, I think, to kind of suggest that the technical object is in a <clears throat> contemporary state of slavery and that therefore part of what philosophical thought can do and that what he's going to do here in this text and in other works is a kind of anti-slavery gesture. It's to kind of almost release the technical objects from their slavish existence. And thinking about you know, the politics of, uh, of the book, um, is that something that struck um, either of you as particularly interesting? Did you maybe just see it as a rhetorical gesture or a kind of flourish or something that just you know, doesn't have a systematic role? Or do you think there is something actually quite systematic about it? That very. 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 I think it's uh, the thing you immediately have to let go of is the idea of a kind of uh, drones and Star Wars, you know, yeah. of, of a whole slave army of uh, <laughs> of robots. Because he yeah. says precisely the robot is what he's least interested yes. in. Um, yeah. So when we talk about enslavement, I think I think to a certain extent this book would be worth reading as a very thorough critique of the concept of work. All that the all that technicity does is not just work, and all that human beings do is not just work. When we have operational schemas that we devise and that we render intelligible and that we therefore share with others, we're not just doing that uh, as a means to an end necessarily, but also as a creation of new possibilities. And in that respect, the technical reality, rather than uh, the object is, is too restrictive here, is a space that we create within which we can ex uh, exteriorize mental schemas, anticipations, inventions. Mm -hmm. And if all that, as is the case at the moment, is to be either an, an object to be consumed and therefore to serve the function of, of trade and commerce, uh, or, or to do something, to do a job for you, then, then that is a very restrictive view of what a technical reality is as a, as a mediation for human intelligence and thought in, as a trans individual medium, if you like, uh, as it is also a re very reductive view of what a human being is. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, if, as we've just discussed in relation to progress, Technics has this, this central role in the kind of progression we're discussing then indeed to restrict it to and to restrict it to, to the notion of work in particular which is what he discusses in the conclusion of, of his work doesn't he is 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 to as it were enslave hmm. the technical process of, of, yeah. of development and which is therefore to to, um, to inhibit what we are and what we can be, the potential that is open to us. So, it, so if you look at a, a text like Culture and Techniques, where he's very explicit about these great auto-normative gestures of things like space travel and that kind of thing, you know, he, he's very much enthus enthusiastic about um, developing these mm. in, the, in the face of whatever political yeah. <laughs> yeah. pressures there might be yeah. or disagreements there might be uh, at the time. Uh, because that's the kind of the reality of the progress that he's interested in is, yeah. is de the development of techniques and how that relates to the human. Lovely. Um, I think we've got a contribution at the back. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Uh, I'll just say the best, my ignorance, because I self explore uh, for myself. So maybe I just have a lot of thoughts. Taking to uh, Dr. Cecil Raspina, actually, I try to think with the uh, Extension of the word extension and also technicity, technology, techniques. I'd like to ask you um, the definition, the nature of technology and techniques, technicity. What I mean is like 
In a way, what I understand is like we may narrow too narrow down the meaning of technology, ST, politics. Because kind of people just bring up the word like cyber, mm -hmm. cybernetics, AI, or something like that. But when Simon passed away in 1989, mm -hmm. that's not the time of like AI really. So what Simon Dung maybe presumed is like a really different level of the idea. What I would like to say is like maybe that's kind of an abstract concept that maybe crystallized it like a phase of like the process. So individual, I mean human beings try to oppose to something fixed in systematic context in milieu. Uh, I don't want to buy, buy for cake like uh, the this and that things like that. But what really wonder is like uh, what technology, techniques, technicity means in this whole situation. Hmm. Yeah, Do thank you. you. you have <laughs> Small question. <laughs> no, okay. I'll, I'll um, volunteer, but not with the definition, not with Simon Dahl's definition of techniques and technicity and technology, but with my understanding or how I live and how I read Simon Dahl, which is, you know, always with a small safety distance and, and perhaps a margin of error of interpretation as well, because it's a very difficult question. It's the, the core that would be the key to unlocking the understanding of, of the ego to a certain extent. Um, in my mind, technicity is the intelligibility and the internal necessity of a schema of operation whose function is to be an interface between the human and nature to a certain extent. And nature understood not necessarily as trees and lawns and birds, but understood as um, all of what the human being hasn't yet integrated in his organized mode of existence. That's how I understand it. So in understanding and mobilizing the potentials of nature, technicity would be that form of intelligence that humans have to create a, an operational schema that can act as, as an interface and as a mode of communication between human organization and natural potentials, or I could, uh, I could say yes. So in the pro process, it's like a three phases, like human beings like to try to be against it, that kind of systematic, organized intelligent, intelligence, like what against what? Against like the maybe like a, the key point of this moment is like interaction with context really. Yeah. So take the list like a particular activity that focuses on like the how interact individual is in interacting with the context. Sometimes like human beings like try to integrate it to context. Sometimes they try to be be, be against it. it. No, as I mean it as a mode of communication. So the, so that which previously could have been experienced as unpredictable or alien, mm -hmm. becomes an associated milieu, because you, you involve it in your operational schema. So that's what I meant by, by an interface. And that doesn't necessarily have to be cybernetics or, mm -hmm. or tool bearing. It can, can take different forms. And you can, I think that that's would be my kind of spontaneous understanding. Whereas the word technology, what it means for me is a science of techniques, which is or a logic, if you like, a science or logic of, of techniques, which incorporates the knowledge of, of what has been made historically and in, in, in the present time uh, and identified as, as technical objects. Simon, did you want to chip in? No, I, I thought that was really well explained, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, just to say, yeah, I mean, so techniques. I mean, Simon talks about techniques of techniques, doesn't he? Which is the technical the understanding of the cumulative technical schemas. That is understanding the real through the modes of operation of modes of causality of technologies. And he, in te so if you go to a text like Technical Mentality, he talks about two modes. I mean, so two technical schemas. One being Cartesian mechanism, you know, like levers and pulleys and that kind of thing. Another one being cybernetics. These are examples of how we can understand the world f through the operations of technology. 
Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. So what he calls technical schemas. And then, so techniques is, as it were, and I think Cecil probably explained this better, but the cumulative uh, technical schemas that we have that we can apply both to technical reality but analogously to other aspects of reality. And he also talks about schemas of emotion and effect and things like that as well. But another, <laughs> another story. And then I guess technology being the, low, the, the, the logic of, of techniques, he also de develops a mechanology, doesn't he, which, which I think is similar to that. It's the application of these and the understanding of machines, maybe. But, but no, I thought that was really nice. Um, I think we've got a contribution from Colin. Kind of builds on the first kind of set of questions that were asked, but also draws on some of the elements that already been discussed. Um, and it's this, it's this particular term, so it's a combination first of this idea of progress, and second about this idea and this term that Simondo uses a lot, and you've already mentioned Cecile, of in internal necessity. Um, so in the sort of idea of the evolution or progressive concretization of the technical object, um, there are some suggestive comments, things like the greatest perfection coincides with the greatest openness of the machine. Um, and that sort of links up to the idea that the concrete technical object approaches the natural object, which is sort of an interesting claim as well. But it is this idea of internal necessity that I'm personally quite confused about or struggling with. What is, how might we understand this idea of internal necessity? Is this a sort of roll back the clock and it goes forward again in the same necessary line of technical development? Or is it something else entirely? And but look, there, I'm saying that no, I mean, what is the rolling back to what? So, like, uh, with the idea of internal necessity, the sense I get is the idea that the mode of evolution, or the process of evolution, the steps of evolution, would nonetheless be resolved in a sort of analogous way or similar way, in a manner. So that's why we might call it a necessary, necessary mode of evolution, or is it something else? Basically, so I mean, how linear is this? Is this? The, is the, evolution of the technical object, and where we don't mind the clock back. So it's not linear, he says it's serrated, mm -hmm. so it has uh, yeah, this kind yeah, of, yeah, it's, a, it's no, but yeah. just, just to say it has this uh, kind of peaks. Um, I, I'm really, that's why I mentioned it a few times, I'm really fond of this idea of internal necessity and mm -hmm. axiomatics. So long as you think it within an oeuvre like Simon Dahls, it puts the emphasis on perfection as openness rather than closure. and and remembering also that his occasional use of the word axiomatics, for instance, he also says there is not such a thing as one logic, and logic is not foundation for thought or the individuation of thought, but each process of individuation of thought brings forth its own logic. And within that logic, you have a set of possibilities that could also be infinite, I don't know, but certainly whatever move you make, will either make more things possible or less things possible. So when you have an, uh, an object, for instance, that needs to be made more attractive to be sold, you can add things on it that make it less aerodynamic or that, you know, that, that make the functioning of, of what this thing can do less perfect. Or you can have a hyper-functionalization in human beings, I would say sometimes specialists are kind of hyper telly are people who, who can who then struggle to bring their knowledge back into the open space. Is that a, is that how knowledge should go necessarily? But sometimes we need it. So the question of this internal necessity for me is um, is to look at the set of possi to try and discover and understand the set of possibilities that you've created and the mode of operation that will make it most open and most synergetic, so most efficient. The more efficient it is, the more it is like a natural object that has evolved over millennia. Um, and the more open it is, I guess, the more synergistic it is, then I lost my train of thought. Right, but it's sort of like, they're always local resolutions. I think that's is that one of the points you're being made, right? So it's like, uh, it reminded me of an interview with Simon Dom where he mentions how, the one with the show yesterday, where like, in the Nordic countries with softer wood, they resolve the problem of the hammer in a different way with the handle than in places with harder wood. So these are both internal nece ne internally necessary, in some of work, um, lines of development, but they're equally valid, so to speak. Um, 
solutions. Is that, is that a fair way? I mean, that, that's where we come back to this idea of serration, because to, mm -hmm. to on the one hand, there's the invention of a uh, of an operational schema and of a structure that then you need to kind of that you can develop further to a certain extent. But once you have the elements, you can perfect the elements. You can change the type of wood you're using. You can improve the springs that you're using. And that follows a relatively linear moment of, of progress. But it won't necessarily lead to a superior or an evolved technical reality, which requires another act of invention and sometimes a complete reorganization of it. So you have, you have moments of, of sudden bursts, and, uh, and then you have moments of relatively tranquil tinkering and, and improvement <coughs> and perfection. Is that, does that, yeah, is no. that wrong? And that kind of connects to what you're saying about the limits of human progress, which is all about these phases coming to being, and then people just work away at them and they saturate. And it's kind of similar to that. It's that same kind of dynamic of the creation of the phase and the saturation of the phase. And then but keeping something open, or hopefully finding something open that uh, some kind of singularity can connect with it to to create a further invention. But but no, I thought that was. Cool. <laughs> I'm not sure I can add to what you said. Actually, I thought that was really really comprehensive. Um, what I find quite interesting is that the technical object, even if it has a serrated evolution, it has this sort of very complex interior play between the levels of element individual ensemble. And I think that's really, really important to bring into play, to not fall back to very simplified notions of what is an evolution, what is progress, how does it all work. I mean, the, even in contemporary techniques, what's so interesting is that, you know, we live in digital technology and everybody who wants to make money asks him or herself, what's actually the next big thing? Where do we need to look? And nobody can say, you know, even people that work in this technology, a lot of times Apple's produced so many products that have ended their lines, like their television and so on. So they can't say where things are going. And I think the internal logic that you see between developments on the level of the element, which is, I think, for Simon Dor, the most important technical sort of sphere or level or sphere in which something's developing, but the interplay of the element in the individual object and in the ensemble, that makes it also confusing and lovely. Yeah, that yeah. nice. Sorry, do you want to um, come back no, or develop on that? It's a wonderful comment. Thank you. Anyone else? Kind of the internal yeah, necessity okay. is only driven by a problem. And the te technological progress is always driven by, by problematics. You know? So you have to resolve the problem. But when there is a problem, if you don't resolve it, you get the, the machine does not work. So in, for example, the, the gimbal engine, that because it, it was invented because the previous models were not able to resolve the problem of heating, of overheating due to the job effect. So that is why in the, in the progress of technical objects, there, there is an internal necessity, which is technical. But in the, the example that says, Cecile has given, for example, I remember Simon said somewhere about uh, car manufacturing. So sometimes uh, the manufacturer will have to move to give, um, I mean, for in order to sell better, then it has to uh, give it a form which does not facilitate the car to, uh, to, 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 to move faster. So you, could, you have to sacrifice the functionality, that's to say the technicity of the object in order to, uh, to, to have a better sale. So this, that, would be, uh, that is not an example of it. You mentioned the fact that that Simon Don cuts a rather odd figure if you think about it in the context of British cultural studies. Mm. Um, and insofar as technology gets talked about at all in that context, it tends to have a very kind of Canadian flavor to it. Um, so McLuhan and so on. Yeah, yeah. And historic. Yeah. Um, and I just wondered whether you'd come across work that was a kind of rapprochement between that kind of Canadian tradition and are they kind of at odds with one another? I can't think of anything off the top of my head that has infused me 
in that area. The Canadian tradition tends to be more determinist in the McLuhan mode. A lot of what I'm not an expert on Canadian sure. philosophy, but a lot of it does. Although there's a lot of um, sympathy for Simon Dunyan in the Canadian uh, media work as well. So there's some, there's there's more Canadian uh, academics working on, on Simon Dunyan media than yeah, in the British context. I, I think the Malamphys being yeah. Dan and Nandita Malamphy being. Yeah. Uh, in, in particular, whereas with the British cultural studies approach, you know, coming from Raymond Williams and, 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 and beyond, tend to, or the tendency I've seen is that they tend to think about technology in the sense of affordances. So, what affordances do technology have for the individual person? Um, or, you know, the technologies are socially shaped. So, it's always that there's a humanistic uh, element in control of the and then of, of you know the technological uh, either development or usage uh, which tends to mean then you can you don't have to talk about technology you can just talk about technologies as uh, something through which discourse occurs and it's the discourse which is important and there's an awful lot of media and cultural studies which which kind of takes that approach and which is the one that uh, I kind of set myself against a little bit. Probably the closest um, in, in media communication would be someone like Hitler in the German tradition who takes very seriously technology and in a similar way to Simon Dunn perhaps talks about epochs of technology, different eras of technology and the transformations that um, that occur between the human and the technology at different times, um, obviously to different ends. Yeah. But but I think that tradition is probably more closely a, 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 of any of which interests me. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I have a question coming from the perspective of being primarily a critical theorist rather than a philosopher, um, and this is kind of sparked by the mention this is to both of you. Um, interesting to your thoughts on this because I don't have an answer or a take on this in both the upholding of the goals of efficiency and openness um, which was mentioned in the context of a definition of technical objects but once we transition to the political the normative or the moral or the social at least in contemporary political theory it seems like these two ideas in some ways are at the root of most critiques of contemporary capitalism or contemporary politics insofar as they're opposed so the pursuit of efficiency um, contradicts the goals of openness or democratic and deliberate, uh, democratic liberation or debate or critique and vice versa. So both of them seem to be goals in a perfect technical object or in its progression, but once you transition to a political level, these are actually ideas are at least intention, if not for some in the future. So how that transition, how you both might bring that transition in symptoms work more generally. <laughs> a really good question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very important one as well. Um, I, I have a feeling that what you just mentioned, uh, which is really primordial, the fact that uh, what drives individuation is the problem, mm. um, is, it has to has to come into this equation. My first instinct would be that if efficiency is a dogma of enslavement in the sense that everything that is efficient is necessarily work in the sense of production or consumption or you know or control in the very narrow sense of the word um, there, there you probably have to have a, a theory of efficiency that would that would have to be a critique of a reductionist kind of ideology of work, I would, I would almost <coughs> say that um, that's, I'm going to hand over to <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, now, I was just thinking very quickly about efficiency and openness. Uh, I, I guess one contemporary area of thought regarding that is around you know, data. You know, how, uh, how, we, how data is used, how data is owned, um, uh, and what, what 
and what, what data means politically. <coughs> so in, in the sense of efficiency, it kind of brings to mind the you know, control society kind of stuff that we, you know, we uh, are familiar with. In terms of openness, thinking more about um, uh, freedom to use data. Um, no, to think, think. It kind of brings us to a kind of liberal binary between surveillance and freedom in a way, that which tends to be the way that we think about data at the moment. And I'm not sure that's necessarily a healthy one. It's a very restrictive one. Um, as in data, it tends to be, to, I'm not mangling this a little bit, but I think what Simmons can help us do, I'm going to talk about this in my talk a bit more, hopefully a bit more clearly, but <laughs> Simmons can help us do with the notion of the trans individual is maybe not start from the liberal subject and thinking about data from that perspective and what it gives the liberal subject and what it, uh, especially the neoliberal subject, I guess. Um, but by starting with something like the trans individual, it means that we have to rethink who owns data, whether it needs to be more openly owned and used for wider goods, as it were. So it kind of, I think Simmons can help us lead us down those kind of critiques of efficiency and control. He can kind of um, see these as a shutting off of a, poten of a resource, as it were, a resources with potentialities, uh, and also lend us an opening um, uh, and a new way of using that resource. Sorry, it's a bit mangled. Hopefully, I'll be a bit clearer tomorrow <laughs> about it. But that's kind of the way I kind of try to think about those terms efficiency and, and openness in relation to something contemporary. So. Actually, one thing I could add to this is that perhaps um, this is one of the reasons why I, I uh, haven't published much on Simon Doyle. I said I've been thinking a lot about noise. Uh, noise not in sound, but noise as in statistical variation and, and uh, uncertainty. And perhaps that is something that, that is something that I'm trying to do in, in the talk that I've prepared for you was to think about Simon Don by integrating the way that we think today about noise. And the example I'm going to be giving is uh, one of the two examples of, of uh, extreme inefficiency actually, but then it turns out not to be quite so inefficient is um, noise traders in, in, in the financial markets. So to look at how these kind of amateur individuals, so-called amateur, I mean, they're not institutional investors, they don't have the big capital at their heels, but often they kind of aggregate in you know, online groups, they share information sometimes to a certain extent, and um, uh, it's a kind of open form of organization. It's not completely innocent either, obviously, and um, it's a problematical example, but I, I think that could be one area where this looking critically at the problem of noise and how that can be thought alongside Simon Dorn, whether Simon Dorn needs a little bit of, you know, if, if we need a little bit of stretching there. Mm -hmm. I just wonder whether anyone else has had the same fear when reading specifically for noise. Simon Dorn is obviously looking for a way of revalorizing technology that isn't according to the values of efficiency. But I'm not sure he ever succeeds in doing that other than just finding different values or speculating that there might be different values driving the repurposing of certain already existing technologies or the creation of new technologies and new media. But actually, what you're left with is, if anything, an intensified concept of technology as through the concept of efficiency and an even unclearer sense of what the new values ought to be as opposed to the ones that are ready to drive the productive system. If not, it's just a very vague sense that you did that they need to be different. And that, it's a, I guess what I'm saying is a kind of feeling of confusion, but then at the end you're just wondering, well, isn't he actually in favor of efficiency? Because that, that is really the only way one can define technology as a way of establishing efficient relationship, productive relationships with the natural environment. But very good question, because um, Simon Law was very interested in asiology on, on the theory of value. And um, he doesn't want to simply talk about asiontology. He wants to, uh, to talk about asiontology. 
this Hussein complement between ontology and asymmetry. What is asymmetry? Is a, a genesis of, a, we can say, the individuation of values. Because efficiency can promise us one type of value, for example, because it is efficient. But this is not sustainable. It's like the way when you talk about um, um, the progress of civilization, that if it, if it continues accelerating, it does not necessarily um, enter into a new phase. So there must be um, a kind of um, problematic which emerge in this process of, the, of technological development and which leads to a new way. So asiontology is not uh, so that's why you want to talk about asiontology, that is to say that this value will not last like such as such, but it necessarily has to be problematized. And then we can enter into another. Uh, so there is a, 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 a he he was um okay, he didn't directly criticize efficiency, but you can see that for Simon Don, he is always looking for um, for another kind of a, a, a reconciliation between technique and culture. And this is a, precisely the question of value. Because if you look at the machine, you look at the robot, when you think of it as uh, efficiency, then that is a slave. When you look at the robot as if it will betray us and dominate us, then uh, that is also a question of value, but it's a confusion of value. So what you want to do, of course, is to show that uh, this way of understanding technology is a problematic. So what you want to show is that the robot does not exist. There was a, uh, there was a revealing in the, on the first stage of the mode, he says, what we want to show precisely is that the robot does not exist. Um, I don't and know if he's also question. saying that a particular technology or a technological system is unsustainable. That kind of reflection is, it doesn't reject efficiency. What you do is you shift the scale at which you make the value judgment. So you say, well, in order to, for, for example, a particular society to be sustainable, then there needs to be a change within the technological system in order for it to be sustainable. But that is still a form of um, judgment that is about efficiency because it, what you do is you just shift the scale at which you regard the system. But it's still a question of efficiency. Yeah, but uh, efficiency is not necessarily bad. Mm, right, yeah. No? Because when you say that, when, when, when uh, Simon Don, like for example, like, uh, when you talk about the Gimba engine, mm. it is efficient. It's more efficient than previous engines. Mm -hmm. So it's not that efficiency is bad. But what Simon Gogh wants to do is not simply say that this object is efficient, so it is better. Yeah. He, he doesn't say that because it's more efficient, then it is better. Uh, but this does not say efficiency is bad. Now, what he wanted to say is that in order to understand or in, in order to resolve the problem emerged from culture between, because of the antagonism between culture and techniques, you need to think of technicity. You need to think of the genesis of technicity. Mm -hmm. Now here is the question, what does it mean by the genesis of technicity? The genesis of technicity can only be understood from the perspective of the genesis of civilization. That is to say, there is an individuation of civilization. So, you said, mean, so when, when you, well, that's what I, well, which I was trying to address in my talk, uh, what does it really mean by genesis of technicity, and how do genesis of technicity go beyond these oppositions between efficiency and non efficient and, uh, um, and, and because that part of from the mold is the most confusing part, the third part, the third part of uh, when you talk about the genesis, genesis of technicity, but for me it is the most important part. Mm. Okay. Add to that, I think it's a bit, um, one needs to know that the notion of efficiency in 1958 was very different than the new liberal notion of efficiency. Yeah. I think it's a bit, um, 
it's a bit too broad if we just want to escape every notion of efficiency and then say, can we please have another value? Um, because you need to see how local it's actually used. So it is used in the way that he clearly said the windmill turbine is much more efficient than the turbine we had before. But he has a very different notion at the same time in the genesis of technology when he says, again, which I don't like actually, I prefer the efficiency. Um, so he says, oh, the most abstract engine is the most beautiful engine. So he has this example of this engine that you can take from a motorcycle and put into a boat, and wow, it works in both vehicles. Fantastic. So that's the most, for him, that's always the most perfection or the biggest beauty of a technology, technological object is then. And I'm, um, so I'm not so sure if I would, you know, rather make a tick under that value of, oh, the most abstract is the best, or if I would say, okay, um, it's most efficient. I think the notion of efficiency he uses is a lot of time the better integrated one. And that's a different notion of efficiency than the neoliberal economic efficiency, faster, better, more capital. So it's how is it better integrated? How does it serve the situation better? So I think it's also a bit mean if we so, you know, informed by neoliberalism, sort of put efficiency completely on the table as a function. Thank you. I wonder if I might uh, draw us to a close, but with one question to you both, just to kind of um, round, round us off. Um, and it really, uh, really is just an invitation to uh, say, what's the importance of, of Simondon, generally, and this text in particular, so either, both, uh, to your own work? So not about Simondon, but what, what you see as your own uh, projects and how, if at all, uh, you want to kind of account for the influence of Simondon on that? Shall I go first? <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I guess it, it, for, for, for my own work, uh, his importance is in, in several areas. I've already talked about the problems in media and communication studies with um, giving a good account or a reasonable account of technology and I think that that's what primarily drew me to Simon Don is that he sits in between the determinist and the non-determinist as it were in his causality is one of indetermination to a, to a certain extent uh, and in the work that I'm doing at the moment I'm kind of interested in his notion of aesthetics actually I think he's got a really interesting notion of aesthetics as sitting between techniques and universal thought and I'm interested in how a lot of media theory actually comes out of different um, strands of aesthetics and what his notion of aesthetics can do to help us understand that and maybe transform that to an extent. I don't know, I haven't got very far with this, yeah. <laughs> but that's kind of something that interests me. Yeah. Um, and then his notion of philosophical thought on top of that, yeah. taking that further. So that's kind of what I'm trying to work on at the moment. Yeah. Thanks, Simon. Yeah, we appreciate it. Just the other thing with your, your work at the moment, say, on noise and so on. Uh, for me, Simon mm. Dahl is uh, on, in, in the background a really, perhaps the most important mm thinker for me. To get. Mm -hmm. I, I also, um, it's the generosity of his thought, the ampleness and the openness mm -hmm. which is, I, I think, without exaggeration, a kind of infinite dimension of, of his thought. On the one hand, he goes back to a medieval problem without hesitation, which is that of individuation, and he makes it completely contemporary. And, uh, and he does so in a way that thought can flow all the time across boundaries of knowledge that normally confine people to a certain domain. And that is um, an openness that I, uh, I find extraordinary and generous and also kind. So there, there is a huge room. The, the, what I do have with Simondon is, on the one hand, because I'm so attracted to this way of thinking, and and he also creates a resonant hole in his thinking, where, which is 
a really quite impressive arch because there's a metaphysics, there's a philosophy of nature, the philosophy of, of techniques. Um, at the same time, I have felt that because of this, I needed a safety distance for my own work because I, I was thinking about the problem of noise and uh, that's why I thought also the question of efficiency was really important. You, it can be addressed from within Simondon's work to a certain extent, but I think I, I have a similar hesitation there. And so I, ha I felt that he's there with me all the time, especially what you've mentioned, the, the notion of the problem. Um, and at the same time, I felt that I, that I needed, perhaps I will be able to come back to him once I've saturated my noise excursion. Yeah. Uh, but I, I certainly felt that some things, in order to be able to think them, I needed to turn my back on him, but know that he's in my, yeah. that he has my back. That's right. <laughs> Something like this. Lovely. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, and uh, please join me in thanking Cecile and Simon for getting us up to